My name is Radcliffe Bailey. I'm an artist. I live in Atlanta, Georgia. What planet I'm from? That's a good no. <laughs>thinking about this the other day, I was thinking about um, artists like Paul Robeson to uh, one of my f uh, favorite musicians, Fela, and you know, I think part of it was that I, f I feel like their practice doesn't necessarily come from j just from making art. I think it's probably part of trying to bring life, everyday life into their practice. I mean, it's almost like um, practitioners who are trying to solve a problem, like a doctor. I mean, but, you know, in the older traditional sense, or not even really thinking about it. And sometimes I think that artists um, um, are not necessarily, we don't choose it, it chooses us in a way. And so, and sometimes it's being chosen as like when you're a little kid and you're just like drawing and you're directed to go this direction or you were a different kind of learner and you picked up information in a different way. You know, um, I don't necessarily question the kid who writes backwards. I think it makes sense. Um, but then, you know, it's like we're often confronted with like dealing with our own everyday issues as well as like the issues that are all around the world. Um, can't help but be preoccupied by um, what happens in the news every day um, and wanting something that's better. And you know, I found that the best thing for me to do is to deal with myself and project something totally different that goes against it. Um, and in my own little way. I don't see myself as like a religious person as much as I am a um, person that is spiritually trying to find his way and trying to cre um, create the best karma that I can just so that I can move forward. Um, and sometimes it's easier to deal with those that are closer to you rather than trying to think about the world at large because the people that are closer to you are, are the world at large and things that are regional are international and things that are international or regional. I mean, I, was, I, I often think about it because my work is focused on my own um, history um, as an African American um, growing, up in this, growing up in Atlanta, but being from the north and thinking about my own um, histories and thinking about how those things are everyone's histories. It's not just my histories, it's more like the histories of human beings. And we all document it in, in such a way. Go to a music store and, and immediately, like when you walk in a music store, it's like the music is classified and segregated in such a way that I always thought of it as just music. Um, so, you know, that's probably my take. I don't care about the general public, to be honest with you. I really, um, you know, I really don't think much about what people see as much as I see myself as a vessel and things come through me. And so here I am, I have, um, and we all have these super abilities, these, we're almost like, I guess we compare it to like X-Men or superheroes. We all have like these special qualities and things that we can do. And I think, it, when I think of my art, I think it has ability to live beyond me and, you know, live beyond me, beyond the materials. One time you used to think the materials and the images of these images and how long do they last, the objects, but now we have things that are on videotape. We can cast it and send it around the world in a second. I can figure out my DNA with a swab. I can figure out those mysteries. I can think about all those things. And, and you, I think the question was, do I care about what the general public, it's back to that one, general public, 
I don't know. I don't really think about it. Sometimes I think I have to combat those things like that, the negative things that we see in the news and the media every day. I think I have to do something totally different. I also think that I have to take my art outside of the four walls. And I think that sometimes um, the museum can be somewhat of a prison or somewhat of, I mean, it's an important place. But I also think it intimidates many people that many people don't come to the museum. And I'm more interested in making things that um, can talk to the common man. And I always thought, that, well, you know, if blah, blah, blah doesn't know how to read, and I write, and the only way they can get to it is if they knew how to read, well, I think that the thing about art visually um, can go beyond that. You know, sometimes when making art, um, we can get in a position where we're talking about thinking about thinking, so we're making work that's really mine. Excuse my French, but mine fucking the others. I mean, it's just that kind of conversation. So I don't really want to make things I think about thinking. I'm more so into making things that can have conversations with people. They gain to be reelected, <laughs> but um, I think they can support it in a basic way. You know, I think that you know the arts are being cut. I think that, especially in these times, enrollments in art schools should go up. I think that artists have a different role in society. I mean, I think that you know you go to different countries and artists are. Tre treasured and placed in certain positions. And I think it's important when um, they listen. I, but I, I often think that sometimes our country is too conservative in such a way where we don't appreciate those things. Those things are the first things to go after to be cut. Um, and those individuals who make art are seen, are seen as being crazy. I don't think, I mean, that's been going on for a long time in history, but I think it's important that um, our voices are being heard um, because we do create new ways of seeing the world and we do have a lot to offer. And it's a lot of things are not necessarily tangible. They're not the things that we can write out on a paper and say, this is what we have to offer for you. It's not that direct, but I think the things that we have to offer or is this built creativity, creativity just in general? My name is Colin Williams. I live in Montevallo, Alabama. I am an artist and an educator. There's this idea that you frequently hear artists um, kind of expound upon. I think it has a lot to do with the mythology that surrounds uh, art making and artists. Um, that, you know, you'll hear someone kind of eloquently describe this calling that they have and you know um, frequently it's expressed as this innate calling that they have to be an artist and if they weren't an artist they couldn't be anything else you know so this is a very romantic notion and um, I don't I don't believe in that notion in any way whatsoever so um, I think that that speaks to the difficulty that exists within our current culture um, for anybody that wants to, I mean, even if they don't call themselves an artist, um, even if they want to kind of participate in any kind of creative endeavor. Um, although I, I think that the role of creative people and artists in particular is critical to the health of our society, I think it's undermined by a lot of different 
expectations that, um, you know, we could talk about that at length, but various different expectations that society uh, have for people in general and creative people uh, specifically. But, um, so, I guess I'm answering the second part of the question first, but I think that it's much more difficult within our current society to function creatively. And I think that a lot of that is undermined by the consumer culture that we find ourselves in. And because consumer culture demands of people that they not make things, but that they consume things that are already made. I mean, obviously, if you're making things, you're undermining the ability of the entities within that culture that profit um, to sell you things. So if you make your own shirt, even. you know. So I very frequently lament kind of this loss of cultural heritage that I see that has happened you know, just over the course of my lifetime, but is certainly visible if you look back a generation. So I come from um, you know, farmers and ranchers, and my grandparents came through the Great Depression, and my grandparents were basically completely sustainable. So you hear about, you know, a lot about sustainability. There's a lot of uh, people just generally that are interested in sustainability and artists specifically that are doing work on the issue of sustainability. And when I think about that, it's kind of ridiculous to me in one way. Um, I support it philosophically, but I don't think that it's something that should be necessary to begin with. You know, because even though my grandparents wouldn't describe themselves this way, they were completely... Um, sustainable within their practices. So the only thing my grandfather ever purchased during the entire Great Depression was tires for his truck. You know, everything else he could make himself. And so um, I think because we find ourselves in this in this consumer culture that doesn't value and certainly um, does very little to support creativity, whether that's you know, raising your own crops, which I think is a creative act, um, sewing your own clothes, which I think is a creative act, making your own furniture, which I think is a creative act. Because most people, they don't have this creativity in their daily life, whether it's, again, sewing or carpentry or producing your own food, I think that they devalue creativity within artists specifically. And so that I, and I, think, I think our culture devalues that. What they do value, though, is this idea of the artist as a mythic creature, you know, as a mythological figure. And in my mind, um, you know, some, some, some people use that to their advantage, and, and that, you know, that's fine. Um, but in my mind, I think that that undermines and devalues uh, the artistic act. Because if someone thinks that my creativity is magic, and you know all the things that I do in terms of creative thinking, all the things I do in terms of the skill set that I've developed, and all the hard work that um, anyone that's ever made art knows goes uh, into the art making process. You know all that's devalued by this idea of it just you know jumping full form from the head of Zeus, you know already created. So this idea of the the mythic um, um, creative being, if you will. You know, we spend more on, you know, I don't, I don't know how accurate this statistic is, but uh, you hear this battered around, right, that we spend more on military bands than we do on um, the entire, um, at least, governmental uh, support in terms of money um, for artists. So the, the, you know, the National Endowment for the Arts budget is less than the military's budget for, for military bands. And so, I mean, I don't know. I think it's fair to use that as a measure for how we value different roles in society. So, you know, if the military gets half of our discretionary spending, I think it's like 62%, now that you can measure it different ways and people argue about it. But if the military gets half of our discretionary spending, and then within that huge piece of the pie, uh, military bands get this tiny little sliver, and then the arts get some fraction of that sliver. I mean, I think that that's a pretty clear indication of, of at least how our government values art. And I think that that's a travesty. Because if you look back on any culture historically, how do we know the cultures that precede us? We don't know them 
Uh, I mean, we know them in a lot of different ways, but one of the primary ways that we know them is, is through their artistic output. But I think that there are roles that need to exist in society that shape society and are good for society and drive society forward um, regardless of whether the audience understands how that particular tool is functioning. So I think the arts are that way. So you go through historical periods where the public is very aware of the arts and very supportive of the arts. Or even if you go around the world, there are countries that the, um, you know, I think England to a much larger degree than America directly supports the arts. Um, but that doesn't mean that the arts aren't, aren't important. Uh, I think actually in a country that isn't overtly supporting the arts, it becomes even more important that the arts exist. You know, I think you saw this in, um, it's certainly happening in America now, but I think a really good example that I can think of within my lifetime is under, um, you know, the Soviet Union. So if you look at the, the, the Soviet Union uh, after the fall of the um, Soviet Union, it, it kind of decimated their arts uh, in a lot of ways because you had this really vibrant arts community that was working in direct opposition to the um, kind of draconian um, institutions of the Soviet Union. And so when they had that to push against, I think it made the work better in a way. And then once the Soviet Union fell and then capitalism kind of comes, comes into Russia, um, it, it opened up a lot of opportunities for artists. And in one way that was, I think, good, but in, a, in another way, I think the edge, um, or in, ter in terms of the quality of the work, I think diminished in a lot of ways. And I've heard artists say that. I've heard Russian artists actually lament, and, you know, which is kind of <laughs> odd to think about, but lament um, you know, not having this boot kind of on their, you know, um, throat, if you will. My name is Ron Platt. I'm the You Call Curator of Modern Contemporary Art here at the Birmingham Museum of Art, and I live in Birmingham as well in the city. Well, I don't really think of the general public as monolithic. Um, we, you know, we have different audiences for different exhibitions and activities here. And so um, I think I sort of approach each exhibition thinking about um, who I might be sort of like interesting in the work and sort of not really aiming with like anybody particular in mind but trying to make it something that's accessible to everyone but um, sort of rich with content for people who are uh, interested in spending uh, devoting a little more time. Well, just based on my own past experience, yes. <laughs> I mean, there have certainly been um, situations throughout my life where um, I've felt uncomfortable in gallery and museum settings. And actually, I'm sort of glad that I've had these experiences because it makes me aware that other people coming in to our museum um, might be feeling this way too and so I do everything I can to kind of demystify the experience and also not to f not to make people feel as if they're walking into some like hallowed environment. I think the way to bring artists closer to the general public is when you're presenting a certain artist's work that you present it in a way 
that the artist would want um, and not try and sort of fit it in to your own sort of particular agenda. I mean, I'm not going to exhibit an artist who doesn't sort of fit with the, sort of the mission of, of the museum, but once I do sort of determine who I want to be working with, I want to make sure that they have a say in how their work might be presented and um, you know, might try to include their work in um, label copy or wall text, that kind of thing. I think it's important for people to realize that you know, as a, as a contemporary curator, I'm working with living artists and the people who are in my galleries are, are realizing that the objects that they're encountering were made, you know, by people. Well, maybe not an exhibition, but there, we have a we have a large painting in, in, in the contemporary galleries here right now by an artist named Kerry James Marshall, who's originally from Birmingham, but, uh, and who's in his 50s now, hasn't lived here for a, quite a long time. He's in Chicago and has a sort of an international reputation, but uh, we, have an, we have a large and I think a rather challenging painting in the gallery that's called Black Painting, and it is, in fact, a black painting. It's sort of, all of the imagery in it is sort of black on black, and it takes a while, first of all, for people to be able to sort of begin to see the imagery, because it's almost as if you're sort of peering into a, a dark room, and it takes a while for your eyes to adjust. And um, I think there's some, it's a, it's a sort of a complicated painting in some ways, because he's sort of um, conflating the idea of darkness um, as a sort of a condition of sight, but also the idea of blackness and what that means uh, culturally um, in terms of race. He's an African-American artist and is very interested in um, having race be um, a, an issue of discussion in his work. And people have been fascinated by it. And we've had, I've had some very interesting discussions, both in sort of more formal talks, but also just sort of casually with with visitors, and it, it's a very pleasant surprise because it is not an easy work. Artists have an interesting role in in culture. I think. I mean, they're they're not like um, like a doctor or a policeman, where you know everyone at one time or another is is going to need their services. You know, artists artists typically sought out by people who, for whatever reason, are, are interested in, in visual art or whether it's film or music. And, um, but I think artists are, they're often ahead of their times in what they're sort of thinking about. And they definitely think about things in interesting ways and in unique ways. And um, I mean, visual art, you know, it's a language in a way. I mean, it's people make art because they find it's the best way for them to explore and express things that they don't think they can, you know, get across in, in words or through conversation or in another way. So I think there's always going to be a role in society for, for artists. I hope so. Um, and um, it's nice to work somewhere where you know, we can sort of provide a forum for that. Uh, we're the Thomases, Arthur and Roseanne Thomas. We're from Billings, Montana. I think it's uh, that uh, most people are so concerned about the day-to-day -day things that very few people, percentage-wise, are really, really concerned about art. They're more concerned about making a buck, putting food on a table. Well, I think we live in a generation or a time where things are so disposable that we don't appreciate fine art. 
some of the things we found in the museum today couldn't be duplicated again, or that it would take years to master the techniques to reproduce something or to create something. That's not to say there aren't artists in the world today that um, are, are leaving a legacy for us, but um, where the church, you know, 400 years ago uh, had so much influence, I don't see one particular thing that, outside of advertising, that calls for art. Well, first and foremost, I think that we should come to places like this art museum, and we should um, uh, be able to um, be exposed to art so that we can come to appreciate it. So I think that's one thing. And then, um, like us, we'll go home and say, we saw this you know, in Birmingham, and we really enjoyed it. Kind of a word to mouth, I think, is, is a one way. Of course, there's financial ways, too, donations to help uh, do this. I am very interested in museums that have an area for children where they can touch, feel, sit down, and have someone speak to them about it. So I think that that's an important thing for the future, too. I think, uh, speaking of children, I think probably the most important thing that people could do for art is to uh, encourage through example and through helping the children that they have to understand and appreciate art by uh, showing them examples of art, maybe taking them to a museum or just encouraging them to paint and exposing them to things such as that. Well, the first time I can remember is, is uh, in kindergarten, playing with those finger paints. I loved that. It was creative, and uh, I enjoyed that. We both love to write, so that's kind of where things have developed for us, besides of doing the photography. Um, for myself, we both enjoy writing, storytelling as well. So. I had an interesting experience when I was a little kid, about 11, I guess. I was in Indonesia. My father worked for the Foreign Service, so we traveled a lot. And uh, we went to Bali, and there was a, a famous artist that was living there. He'd lived there for quite a long time. He was a uh, stone carver. Uh, he would carve this coral that he dug out from the sea surrounding the island and uh, made pillars and, and just when he built his house out of coral there on the island of Bali, he engraved beautiful uh, carvings into the stone, into the um, coral. And it was extremely intricate. And it was a little tour group that we were on. And uh, the artist, of course, asked people what they thought of him and of the, <laughs> the carvings. And uh, of course, everybody was very polite and just praised it up and down. And he smiled and then he turned to me and he said, what do you think? I guess because he wanted an honest answer. And I said, it's too much. And he smiled because he realized, and he said, he's, he's the only one that gave me a truthful answer. And he realized that it was his, his passion was to work this art so much so that he went overboard and he tried to explain that to the tourists that yes, uh, that's the only failing here was that I just did too much. Of course they all poo pooed that, they said no, no, that's just a dumb kid's answer. It's great, but that, that was his response.
Um, my name is Karen Graffio. I live in Birmingham, Alabama, but I'm a professor of art at the University of Montevallo. Well, right now I very much relate to Kurt Vonnegut's definition of an artist. And he said that um, the artist is the canary that society carries into the mines, making reference to um, miners would carry a canary. And when the canary died, that meant that there was uh, toxic air. And at this time, I feel like, in some ways, society is, um, instead of integrated with the artists, uh, they're dangling the artist ahead to taste the current um, climate, literally the physical climate, the spiritual climate, the psychic climate. And um, if the canary's quiet, folks better run. I think in previous times, and even in um, uh, within my lifetime, I think the role of the artist has changed. I think that the artist was um, an, um, an amazing um, comfort and provided the medicine of beauty. But at this current time, I'm not sure that beauty is the medicine that society needs. There's times when I felt like story was the medicine. And um, I'm not trying to define society as sick, but I do feel like that um, we're in deep need of spiritual and psychological nourishment. Functioning as a canary in the minds isn't quite nourishing to the artist or society. I feel like that this is a, a time where um, it's an uncomfortable passage for artists. I think I always have the general public in mind. I, I am the general public and um, that both frightens me <laughs> and gives me tremendous energy, um, but I don't necessarily want to um, make art that um, puts blinders on the general public. I think that's one perception of an artist is that we comfort the general public so that they don't have to think about being the general public. I think a lot of my artwork comes from my personal history. I think um, being born in South Mississippi, um, I can trace a lot of my urge to create to um, Christmas when I turned 12 and my great-grandmother gave me a grave plot for my Christmas present and she told me that if I, um, and she took me out and I stood on my grave plot and she said that if I accepted salvation, escaped the mortification of the flesh and received a glorified body that doesn't eat, dance, or, um, or jewelry. And so I think in some ways my artwork is um, a way that I've tried to pin my fears um, to that moment and to try to um, liberate that history of standing on my own grave. It also really enchants me um, to have had such a theatrical experience. So while I'm running from my personal history, I feel like I'm also embracing it. Some of the most significant um, history of my country, I feel like has happened in my lifetime. I uh, was in third grade when JFK was shot. 
I remember watching his speeches and then watching um, his funeral. My father had me um, watch all of Cassius Clay's fights and then when he became Muhammad Ali, my father was telling me so many things about um, what people are, that aren't privileged to receive power are allowed to have sports, music, and religion. And I always felt like um, people that were opted in to those things um, did something more beautiful than people who opted into power. So in my way, in my personal history, um, um, art is like being given sports, religion, and um, music instead of becoming sheriff of a small county in Mississippi or a senator in Alabama. I'm very thankful for that. <laughs>